We might as well start at the beginning of the album. Well, interview us then. Yeah, I mean, well, in that case, I might as well start interviewing you. How are you wearing that leather jacket? You know, I don't know. No, it's stupid. Yeah. Well, you can talk. Oh, yeah, you can talk. You can, can talk. Yours. Listen, say something, Russell. <laughs> say, I can't eat my current bun. I can't eat my current bun. I'm sticking up your ass. See? <laughs> <laughs> Guess what was inside? Yes, raisins. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right, right. OK, well, uh, we might as well start at the beginning of the uh, Raisin story, really. Yeah. And, um, no, I didn't. Well, you didn't, I know, but uh, the, whole march the, march line, see? <laughs> the whole March will die kind of uh, saga and stuff. And the well, way there's in which plenty it... of Raisins in there. <laughs> <laughs> and the way in which it uh, sort of started out as, a, as, as an album. I mean, last time you were in London, you had a bunch of lyrics, and uh, yeah. unbelievably enough, now you've also managed to uh, throw together some music. Oh, that's right. Um, yeah. What about the, the songwriting that. process that's this time? That's true, around? yeah. We do that sort of stuff all the time, don't we? Yeah, our producer said, why don't you go and down throw together some music for these wonderful fine lyrics? Mm -mm. And I well, said, all right then. And I, I just went in there, you know, without a word of a lie, not afraid. Went in there with me bass, bang, 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 there it was. And that's it, really. It was that one, yeah. When it came down to sort of uh, the way in which you ended up working together this time, I mean, obviously, when 1916 you were shut away in the countryside and it was a bit of a result in the old songwriting Chemistry. Well, I fought it. I went up the boozer as much as possible. <laughs> I mean, I don't like being shut away in the country, you understand? There's no women in the cottage, so... There weren't any in the boozer either, really, were there? No. Terrible scene. I hate all that get your shit together in the country stuff, man, you know. Down at Rockfield, going stir-crazy. <laughs> Some bloody cottage whitewash. <laughs> you know. I was brought up in the country. My feeling about it is if you're there two weeks, you've seen most of what you're going to see, you know. So does that answer your question, Phil? No, but oh. uh, don't worry about it. I mean, in the well, that was what you touched on, you know, the last time you were speaking. Right? Yeah, the, I mean, the, the, the whole point about, uh, about that question, in fact, was, I mean, like, it was a pretty idyllic situation you were in, whereas this time you were, like, miles apart from each other and all that. I mean, how did the whole songwriting partnership work on, on that level? Because obviously you must have been writing separately. Well, we had a phone off the hook at each end, you see. And we turned the amps up very loud. It was a bit tinny, but it seemed to work all right. No, I wrote words and I wrote three songs on my own out there and they wrote a load of riffs down here, you know, so just... Um, and then we would go over there and... Bending things to fit, you know, much like plasticine, really. Mm. Or wrought iron. Wrought iron. Pipe awesome. cleaners. <laughs> yeah, that part, is, it has been, it was a traumatic year prior to, to uh, the recording. It was the pretty app. normal, actually, for us. <laughs> it's always traumatic for us. I don't think anybody's ever had a look like we get. It's incredible, man. What is, that's the only reason survive? I'm here is to show people it hasn't killed me. Yeah, you survived, I'm sure. <laughs> you say, this'll get him. This, this, that's it now. But, <laughs> you know. What do you think all these traumas are kind of down to? I mean, you know, you, they do seem to follow you around, as it were. They I mean, do, don't they? Are you, are you particularly difficult to they work with? They smell fear, you see, that's what it's like. Unbelievably difficult to work with. I, yeah, yeah, we are. Absolute bastards. <laughs> but we like it. Well, I'm not, he is. I am. But he's not. Sure. Used to cost us a lot of money, you know, before we found out about hotel bills that we paid them, you know. So we stopped smashing up hotel rooms then? Yeah, right. Well, I stopped smashing up Phil Campbell. Mm -mm. We smash up Campbell's hotel room. Yeah. Because he's got to pay for that. Should have seen them in New Zealand the first time we went down there, boy. All the furniture out of Pete Gill's room <laughs> and the plants, one of which managed to fall over on the white carpet in the corridor. <laughs> Brilliant. And the. Dance of the Flaming Arsehole. <laughs> That's in, true. In the restaurant. <laughs> you got a round of applause for that. Hi, two naked roadies, a naked drum standing on chairs, sheets of toilet paper stuck in the crack of their bum, and the, their personal assistant sitting fire so we give them like half a pint of log, you have to drink it before it reaches your house, right? In the restaurant. These guys are going. <laughs> brilliant. It's not Great brilliant fun. here. I don't care if you do censor it. Right, coming back to uh, sort of uh, more, uh, you know. Well, it should be more incisive with your questions. You should make it more easy, easy for us easy to understand. To, all right, I mean, uh, explain the whole three manager situation in the space of like, you know, well, well, we almost eat, three months. We eat them, don't we? We eat managers. Yeah, we eat managers, yeah. The one we've got now is fat, so it's going to take us a long time to eat that one. Then well, we'll we, get around to yeah, it. Yeah, we bolted Doug Banker. Well, they just, you know, it's just situations like Phil Carson took over. And then he got off a JVC Records victory, right? Mm. So obviously he's going to take it. I'd take it if I was him, you know. So he dropped all his bands. He dropped Bonham as well. Then we got older Sharon, but she only took us over as a favour, really, just as a stopgap. But she, that was another horror story, you know, another tissue of lies. 
It really was. Nobody ever believes me, I don't know why. And then we had Doug Banker. Doug Banker. We, we ate him. He was too far away, he was in Detroit. I was in LA, these guys were in London. I mean, there was no chance of any communication, so I said, enough, you know. Enough's enough, Doug, I said. He was a good geezer, though, did his best. That's how we got into scratch fever, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah. Ted doesn't good. like cut scratch fever, apparently. He's only jealous because it's a heavier version than his. Yeah, I've got a bass player on now. Originally, I, I heard that he was all in favour of you doing the track, you know. He probably is, it makes him some money. Mm. We were told he didn't like it, though. But we don't care. Yeah, couldn't give a care of it. Better than dragging a dead deer around the room, isn't it? Mm. Right, I mean, since we are actually talking about the album, I mean, yeah, another track that you did on there, which, well, you know, that one that you're about to put out. Oh, that, that one, Well, yeah. he forgot it last time he was oh, on the yeah, just told me that, yeah, it was great, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you also read did Hellraiser, I mean, you know, do you want to just uh, tell us a bit about that? Cause, yeah. Well, I wrote the words for it, right, for the Oz album. And um, we got this deal through Phil Carson, actually, he does the favour, because they wanted the Hellraiser for the title track of the Hellraiser 3 movie. So I wrote another song called Hell on Earth, and apparently they're using both of them, which is jolly all right with me, you know. So. We re-recorded Hellraiser. Hell on Earth was another one, I wrote that in four and a half minutes. Mm. Apparently when it comes down to writing lyrics and stuff, you're constantly revising them in the, in the studio as well. I mean, Some of them, Bad Religion took me weeks to get, I just couldn't get the bloody thing to keep still, do you know what I mean? But uh, March or Die, straight down, Orgasmatron was another one. Woke up in the middle of the night, walked over to the sketch pad, wrote it down and went back to sleep. No memory of doing it at all. Like, you know, Beethoven auto rising, you know. Sleep writing. Yeah, sleep writing. Right, and you to sleep, you know. In your hotel room. Better than sleep walking, isn't it? Hey, you end up anywhere. These are something to read. Next question. Well, I say that. set up the title track in that case. Yeah. I mean, is that, is that the, the sequel to 1916 as far as you're living? Sort of, I suppose. It's a continuing theme, I guess, in 1916, March or Die, about the futility, the futility and stupidity of the human race. Something that's never ceased to amaze you, in fact. No, it never ceased to amuse me. I think it's all hilarious, you know. <laughs> they can't see further than the, the bottom of the page ever, you know. As long as the book's balanced, we don't give a shit. Next. So it seemed very strange to me. Crass, you could say. Puerile, you might add. Puerile. There's a P-U-E in that, you know. There's not many words like that, not except many. for Tuesday. <laughs> right. I mean, another track on there is obviously the, um, the ballad, Ain't No Nice Guy, which, um, I mean, you showed me the lyrics last time, and I, I, thought it, I kind of thought it would be some sort of fast song, and unbelievably enough, there's acoustic guitars, which he absolutely hates all over the place, you know. Well, why shouldn't he? He didn't play them. <laughs> I told him this last week. Mm. I mean, what, what about that? that? I mean, that is really like an out and out ballad, which really. So was 1916. So was Love Me Forever. Love Me Forever was, you know. It was still exactly the same. Started out quiet, went heavy, went quiet again. Yeah, but it was like. It was um, all electric. I mean, this is acoustic. <laughs> I mean, everybody keeps being surprised by this ballad. Why have you got a ballad? It's been three albums in a row now. Tisk. Oh, okay. No, it does. It does seem like. Probably we're saving on ashtrays. Yeah, it does come as a genuine surprise though, hearing like you know acoustic guitars Why? of that nature on, on a motorway down. Because you just, I don't, don't think anybody would. We're genuinely not supposed to do that, are we? Yeah. No, you're not. No. So we must interrupt the train of thought. Yeah. Got to have a new frame of reference now to include acoustic guitar and cellos. Yeah. And I mean, piano. Well, I'm thinking if it's all right for Slash to play lead guitar on it, it's all right for me to play acoustic guitar on it. Bloody Glockenspiel's all right, if you ask me, if I feel like... Well, I'll have on the next one, shall we? Yeah, Glockenspiel, I'll have two, two of them. Two Glockenspiels. Yeah, and a bloody bass viola. Why not? I mean, do you feel as though perhaps some, some of that process is due to the fact that you find as though you can actually accept those kind of things now more than you could in the past? Because it always seemed as though the motorhead thing in the early days was definitely like, you know, well, the notion of putting a, a... I mean, you always did slower songs, but ballads themselves were not... Well, yeah, it's, we it's, it's like any band, you have to progress, right? That's because true. we stood still for years, you know, doing stuff that we thought people wanted to hear. 
it also gets really boring to play the same old thing. So it's a, a challenge for us. We're going in for three weeks every bloody year to do an album, coming out with the same sort of songs you know, all the time. So, I mean, I was brought up on the Beatles anyway, you know. And they changed every album. You know, you could never rely on them to be the same. You know. And they'd try anything. And I, and of course, they had the money to hire this the London Philharmonic that you'd get, you know. we just get a keyboard with a few inserts and all the same. I don't see why we shouldn't diversify, you know. It's valid, you know. In okay, today's modern know. society already. Yeah, I mean, would you would you consider perhaps you know expanding that and 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 really moving totally outside the, the constrictions of my head and maybe doing something even like you know something that is exactly constricting if we can progress, right? There will be constriction. What do you mean? Uh, what the band? Do you mean? Yeah, I mean like no, individually. No, no, no. I mean, we're not, we're no, we wouldn't do that, Phil. We're, we're not going to become we're an acoustic band. That, you know. If that's what you're saying, is it? Hitting them. It, yeah, it was along 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 those lines. Along really, those lines. Were but we're trying to break that down, you know, by doing a couple of different tracks every album. I don't see why you shouldn't. I mean, anybody else in this genre, it's another good word for this time of day. It is, isn't it? Would not get this what, this much amount of stick for doing, you know, oh, Iron Maiden doing the ballad, you know, it's all right for them, isn't it? Because, you know, Bruce sings in a high voice, it's okay to do ballads, you know. Well, there you go. I don't give a, I don't give a carrot for that, you know. I rest my case. <laughs> All right. I mean, in terms of the live context, will you be, would you be playing that? that, you know, that particular Can't never one? tell. Must come to show. I doubt See if group play it. But I doubt that we will, I know. Actually can't tell. Mystery to me. Because you haven't rehearsed for so long, you mean? Well, no, I've heard it all the time. I play this album all the time. It's the first one I ever have. It's the first one I like every track on. 1916 was close for that, Brad. I wasn't crazy about Shut You Down, you know. Bit of rush, but I, I like this one every track. I've been playing it like buggery all the time. All right. I mean, let's maybe talk about the way things are slightly, uh, you know, in a, in a broader context in terms of the way in which things are going for the band in terms of America. Because I mean, you've never really managed to crack America, but it kind of seems as though people never are coming around. Near cracking. <laughs> no, it, it seems better. like people this time are actually maybe coming around to your way of thinking. Yeah, it gets better for us each time we go over there. Well, we were too early for the first wave of British heavy metal over there, and we were too late for the second. So now they're catching us up now, I think. Or well, I'm not sure. What's that. Maybe we're going parallel, but now dive into the middle. I really don't know how these things work. You know, if we get lucky, we get lucky. I said. You can't project things like this band because we do what we want anyway. I'm not given by what's trendy. You know, the record company tries to <laughs> suggest things too. You know, one manager we had once said. Boys, I want you all to go and get a, your hair cut. You know, like, just about there. Because it, I can get you on all sorts of... And we said, <laughs> you know, joking. Like. He said, no, no. I mean, he was really serious. It took days to convince him that we weren't going to do it. He couldn't believe that we weren't going to do it, you know, his advice. And he knew the market, you know. Three months later, everybody had long hair. <laughs> it was when the punk thing was in, you know. Well, that's kind of weird, because I mean, you were always associated with those, those bands anyway. Yeah, but they're desperate to have a hit record too without spending much money. Haircut's much cheaper than putting out albums with long hair for two years if it ain't in fashion. <laughs> it's just, I don't know. The music industry doesn't know a damn thing about music. It doesn't know a damn thing about what the kids think about it on the street, nothing. Mm. They just take advantage of something that's already happening and exploit it. Take it down to its lowest common denominator and sell it till they flog it to death, right? That's what the music business does. Bunch of bloody parasites. I'd have to agree with that. Wouldn't I then? Well, he would, yeah, if he could talk. I can't talk to Dags, I'm hungover. Can't talk at the moment. It's a bit, bit of a hangover. It's a bit hungover. He'd be alright later, though. Come back later right and we'll talk to him. I mean, when you look back at, at the way things, things have developed, do you feel as though you, know, you have been hard done by in any way in terms of? of the last couple of years and that, because 1916 should have been a... a I don't really feel we're all done by, I think we've been pretty lucky actually to stay going this long, you know, with the luck we've had. I mean, the band's been on the verge of like, absolute, but we've always been broke. And we've been on the verge of absolute bloody collapse, nearly constantly <laughs> since about 1982, you know. But it's all right, I mean, it, it makes you more determined. Well, if, if you're like me, it does anyway. Mm. And then... It does know, with this band, it's like that anyway. Voice. It survives in chaos. Because <coughs> if you give up, you know, you've got nothing for sure. Whereas if you carry on going, something might show up. Right? So I never saw it as an option giving up. 
What about the personal sort of elements in the band and stuff? Because obviously everybody goes on, oh well, you know, now you're living in LA and all that stuff, you know. Yeah. But at the same time, obviously, it must mean that, that something within the personal chemistry might have, you know, dissipated slightly. People always gone on about this, haven't they? Mm. Yeah, I know what you mean, though. We, we don't see each other between tours usually, anyway. Unless, you know, we happen to go in the same club one night and then we don't phone each other and say, hey, let's go out socially. You know, because. Um, we don't even hang around together on the bus, do we? Not much. They sit no. in the front and I sit in the back. I like it cold, I like it warm, you know. It's, um, I don't know, I'm, I'm quite confident in the band, you know, of the band and within the band that we're dynamite on stage, I know that. Yeah, we so know I don't it. worry, you know. Everybody that's has fights, you know. Every family has fights and that's what we are. But we don't have any more of them than the average family. Because none of us is out for a job, you know. <laughs> What about, what about Filthy, who in fact is, is out of a job, as it were, you know, I mean, what, uh, what yeah. went down there, really, I mean? He, uh, it, it was mutual. Was he pushed or did he jump? <laughs> was it Bill or was it Ben? Well, he might have jumped. I might have fell against him. He might have been pushed. He, he might have been, but we'll never know. It's You'll never know anyway. <laughs> exactly, yeah. That's the next question. It's a very personal thing. It was amical. Bull. Yeah, I'm a kebabble. I'm a kebabble. Um, it's like 17 years I've been with him, I don't wish to talk about it. Okay. That put him in his place, didn't it then? Respect, see. Oh. Well, in terms of, of Mickey arriving and stuff, obviously people Mickey are going to ask Mickey didn't arrive, Mickey was already there. Right. He was in the rainbow, saw him. Tapped him on the shoulder. As to the, the last time Filthy left in 82, right? In, um, sorry, in 83. We asked Mickey then. But he, he was busy, 84, early 84. But he was busy then, so he said, no, I can't. <laughs> but this time we got him because he just left Jocker and he was knackered and out of a job and he had payments on his car, you know. <laughs> He's a, a very good drummer. Yeah. Is he He's permanent? Excellent. He, he injects Well, he is permanent. I don't know if he's still in the band. <laughs> uh, I think he probably will. And he's he's uh, good. He's, been, he's worked very well on the two tracks we did. He was like, Really quick, mm. really good. He contributes a lot to to the track with his drumming. Trouble is nobody can yeah. understand what he's saying. No. Swedish. <laughs> Swedish. Is he a Swedish? Yeah, but Elios. my name is Elios. <laughs> no, he's excellent. We are going to, as they say in America, kick some serious ass. The only thing that is wrong with him is he drinks Bud Light. Yeah, he can does do that, that, doesn't he? I saw him drinking Miller Light like, and oh. knocked it out of his hand. It's a bit of disappointing, though. We'll have to get him into a special brew or something nice. You don't have to drink a lot of beer. That boy's worse than you. Mm -hmm. He's going to weigh 250 pounds by the time he's 13. All right, well, I suppose we've gabbled on about uh, pretty much uh, a, ton of, a ton of, uh, of crap and, and sort yeah. of a mixture of shit, which mixture is the crit. Yeah. Final oh, question, really, shrap. is... Final question. Depending which way you want to look at it. Final question is really, I mean, where the well, hell is... Where the hell is... Where does that nickname for Phil Campbell come from? Oh, Zoom. Zoom. It's, it's a nice lolly. It's a lollipop, isn't it? Uh, yeah, it used to be, didn't it? A popsicle, yeah. Ice cream on the inside, wasn't it? Yeah. Like yeah. Phil, see? <laughs> we used to... No. What? I better not say what we used to call him. No, no, I better not say that, no. Not on TV. I right, then. Actually, it's inadmissible he on TV, isn't it? Can't say that on TV. What? Inadmissible? Yeah. But he he's has been trying for years, hasn't he, to get to get a nickname? Oh, obviously. he's been I mean, trying he's been so hard. You know, Zoom, I mean, so we're next, you know. We're next, indeed. <laughs> Possibly. <laughs> well, it was Philip Anthony Campbell. Philip Anthony Campbell. Then and Wizzo, then Zoom. That's right. Mm. <laughs> Possibly there's something called Ton of Bricks or something. I don't know. <laughs> well, it's up to him, you know, and he wants to change his name. It's a free country, mm. supposedly, nominally. You know. Allegedly. Allegedly. Aye, oh, that's very good. It is, isn't it? Only 12 o'clock. No, I can't see the time on this. It's not a watch. <laughs> <laughs> Where were we? Oh, it's just here, wasn't it? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Right. Well, I think that's it. I mean, there's nothing. That was a slow one, wasn't it? That one. Oh, my eyes gone funny. You didn't talk about the album much. No, let's talk about the album, Phil. Yeah, let's talk about your album. Well, um, what do you want to know about it? Oh, what's it called? <laughs> just take my cue from him, that's all you know. <laughs> Yeah, really. <laughs> what do you want to talk about the album then? What, what, what should we talk about in terms of the record? Uh, 
Well, this thing of something. What do you think of it? It seems you've heard it now, right? What I think of it? Yeah. I don't think it's as immediate as 1916. No, that's I think true. There's, there's, um, there's elements on there that take uh, a lot more getting used to. Not a lot more. What, you mean, are you talking about that acoustic track? No, not at all. That's really, no. that's, that's the most instantaneous thing on there. Talking about things like you better run, don't you? And, uh, yeah, you, you, you better run. Yeah, and um, you'll get used to it. It was a fun, fun track. It's yeah. a great track. Because me and Phil Campbell, also, me and Zoom, sorry, <laughs> we, we also uh, <laughs> we weren't sure about that one. You know, it's just uh, do 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 do. You know, we get that that sort of riff, and it's well, it was nothing really, but it turned out really, really well, and we were very pleased with it, Uncle Phil. I think it's a good set of lyrics actually. Written in the John Lee and B.B. King sexual boasting mode, you know. It's great fun to write them. And uh, Stand is bothering you, isn't it? Bad no, it isn't, actually. Ah, bad religion, though. No, bad religion is dead easy, though. It's nice. Name in vain? Is that what you're talking about? No, no. Slightly. Name Slightly, in vain, Slightly, yeah. Name in vain is the, um, the, the my day of this album, I think. Oh, that's, that's, I suppose it is. What's the similarities? I think, I think March or Die itself, as well, it's, it's not quite as. as it's no, clear no, as something like 1916. No, no. It's like this sprawling thing. In, immense. Um, this blob. Seething. Whatever, you know. I, I, I like it though. I, like, I, I thought I couldn't never get it right, you know. But then I, I finally went back to Pete's mix, you know. I did three mixes of it. He did three mixes of it. Mm. Finally, I just went back. I think it takes some listening, but it does get you. I like every track on the album. There's a lot of stuff on there actually that's been taken off. We put some backwards guitar on it, but it didn't really work. I had a lot so of voices on there off. at one point, you know, during the, mar during the marching cadence, you know. Took them all off though, it's too much. It's busy enough as it is, you know. I think it's pretty good. You can waltz to it, you know. You can waltz to it if, if you waltz very, very fast. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I was surprised about Hellraiser, about including that on the album. Because it kind of it kind of works as we weren't going to, and then it, it sort of worked, I th you know. Because it's it's like different, but it's recognisable as well. And Mickey's on that too. I think he does a very good job, considering he only heard it for the first time twenty minutes before we recorded it. And so did I. That's true. So did you. But I mean, you're not the drummer. You can have a couple oh, of goes at that. it, right? <laughs> That's you know? true. Yeah. I mean, Mickey, yeah, he he played really well. On that. What am I doing? Because he did he did get that down <laughs> real fast. Somebody helped me. Didn't he? We got that done really, really quickly. There's Rodi behind him shouting, snare, bang, cymbal. <laughs> Reading off the piece of paper. I think it's a pretty good album, and I think it's better than 1916. When you finally, you know, get it cornered. I can't tell at this stage, you know, I still can't detach myself from it. You can tell me I'm the pilot. I could tell you anything, though, can't I? Tell me anything. Tell him anything I come from. He does, he tells me anything. All sorts of things. Don't care. <laughs> Doesn't care who he upsets. No. Talk about Ozzy as well on that. Ozzy. Uh, that, that, uh, Ozzy. That track. I mean, that, that's a, that is Ozzy, actually a great Ozzy. backing vocal on there. I'm sorry. It's a great backing vocal on the, on the ballad. Oh, he sings yeah. some of the he sings some of the verse. He sings a real he good sings job. some of the lines too. It's not just backing vocal. Actually, he does sound really good on that. Even, yeah. even I like that. Yeah. Even Ozzy. Like I, I thought Slush did a very good job in the middle. Yeah. Thanks. I thought I understand you were going to. Uh, Invite Axel down to the studio as well and not let him in. No, I was going to invite him in and lock him in and leave him there. <laughs> no, I, I, Axel's all right, man. I'm telling you, he's you wouldn't okay. believe the pressure on them people. As long as he's, especially on Axel, because he's the one at the front, and people always go for that one, don't they? You know. But he wears a dress. The pressure well. on him is horrendous, man. And he was weird before, anyway, right? There is a lot of pressure on him, for sure. Yeah. Well, tons of bricks last, isn't it? Yeah. A big, big wooden door. Yeah. Yeah, at the same time, there's been a lot of pressure on you, but you know, there's never Not been. like there is on actual Rose, man. We just shrug it off. I never heard anything like that. Everybody in the world wants his brawls, you know? Just everybody's out to get him now. The backlash is really in. I don't want his brawls, I've got my own. I know you've seen him. So his buns. Well, we're on the bus for three months, you know, you want to see everything. Danish version, see everything. <laughs> Next. I mean, any, any other outside sort of plans or projects that might have uh, come about from, uh, you know, those, uh, well, days, we nights gig, and, and years spent in the rainbow, for instance? We did do a gig once with Vera Lynn, <coughs> didn't we? In 42, wasn't it? Yeah, Fair 1942 it was. Standing on the wing of a beef 24 Liberator, we were. <laughs> out there, up to me neck and mucking bullets. Mm. 
Michael Caine was in it as well. He played George C. Scott. I don't know. Anything, anything can happen, you know. I don't mind. It's like that black leather jacket thing we did for Channel 4, you know. Eddie Clark showed up on bass. Phil Taylor on drums. Phil Campbell on guitar. Me on piano, which I can't play. <laughs> my name. Three sax players. God knows where they came from. All the shades on. It, it looked like really good to me. <laughs> it was wonderful fun, you know. So why not? You can do anything. As long as you can mine it, cheat, you know. I play Glockenspiel. <laughs> the next one. Or two Glockenspiels. Two Glockenspiels. We went on stage one, twice. In tuxedos, you know. Yeah, we went on stage in Santa Monica Civic That's in Texas once. So the audience that? is there and Spike's another going, whoa, I'm out of here. We, <laughs> curtains open, there's a the Lawrence Welk Orchestra, you know. <laughs> it's great. I couldn't find a baton though, that's it. I went on in Chicago once in a pair of bunny ears. There again, you see, I couldn't find the fluffy tail. There's always something wrong, isn't there, you know. Can't, can't quite get it. But, um, yeah. You did dig a burrow, didn't you? Afterwards, yeah, later, later on, yeah. Well, I was hiding, wasn't I? Yeah. Hiding from his parents. Had it from Ted Nugent. <laughs> <laughs> One thing you mentioned before, actually, was, was that you'd been, you know, umming and ahhing about a choice of covers for a while. Yeah. You know, You've got one now. You've got a cover now. Yeah. 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 What, what, what do you mean? Arguing about it? Well, yeah, I mean, it we just seems finally, you finally decided on a bloody Ted Nugent track. I mean, good lord. It's a good riff. It is a good riff, yeah, but it's still Ted Nugent, isn't it? I had to rewrite some of the words. I mean, they're still pretty banal, but um, you should changed, have seen them before I rewrote them. Mm, we changed the key, it's loaded down. Changed the key, bit. yeah. Made it a bit dirgier. Yeah, put a bit more bass on it. Played better sound. Went up the flagpole and see if it looks it. Yeah. Adapted for television by sticking it on a piece of wood and banging a few nails <laughs> it. It just seemed to me like it was a decent choice. I wasn't 100% on it at first, but they taught me around, you know, and they put the, they put the track down before I put the bass on it and it sounded good, you know, so why not? I mean, why not? On the first Matt Red album, there were four covers, I think. We've been trying to do a cover of something since '84. Yeah. And we've never it was agreed always on too rushed, you know. Was, oh, we've only got. Yeah. We could never agree, either, you know. We'd no, all, we never all four agreed. of us would have a different track. And no, we nobody didn't. would like the other one. What do you mean, no, we didn't? What? Are you clocking, Mush? <laughs> Still has the English ambiance. <laughs> <laughs> do you what, John? Do you what, John? I say Captain, I say what? Not me, Gov. It wasn't me, sir, it was Harold Pratt. So Another line out of context. What? You haven't lost any of your uh, English expressions then? Sense of the absurd. You don't no. say dude or anything like that, do you? Really no, I know. certainly don't. And anybody that does say it to me is <laughs> sorry immediately afterwards. I'm not a dude, I'm a real cowboy. Uh, that explains that happening. No, this is uh, the army. It was the army. <laughs> Gone now. Poor lads. Up to their necks in looking bullets where they stayed, most of them, actually. Had to bend down to get it. The question is, I mean, how do you react to, you know, being asked the same questions time and time again? And how you give you, different how answers. And then in the end... We, we just pretend to be somebody else. <laughs> and then we just make up nonsense. He's David Coverdale, it's quite right? Right. and I'm Robert Plant. And I resent you calling us motorhead. You swine. That's a nice bracelet, what's this say? This is just got my name on it, that's all. Yeah. Well, you have to answer the same old boring questions. Did Richard Jobson give you that? <laughs> <laughs> Richard Jobson. He does a nice set of nachos, then, I'm telling you. Anyway, um, well, I'm bored by the same old boring questions myself, aren't you? And I give boring answers. They get shorter and shorter as the day goes on if you're doing like six interviews. And the fifth one is asking the same questions. They get, yeah, no, bye. <laughs> <laughs> or occasionally, <laughs> <laughs> Some people walk in with an attitude, you know, and they ask you the same boring questions. They're really going to get slaughtered. I mean, there's no mercy, is there? There's no mercy when they write it out anyway and publish it later. So I shouldn't have any mercy for them when they're doing it. Right, well, the second sort of uh, set of questions is about the whole sex and sexism thing in rock and roll. Well, How do you view that? that? I've never been accused of that. Sexism? Except by you. No, I mean, we took girls' school on the road, the first all-girl heavy rock band, you know. So, I, I mean, I've always thought that girls should play more rock and roll. 
I'm all in favour of it. There's no sexism. Is he went to see one last night? Never the Bride. Yeah, <laughs> Never, the, Never bride. the Bride. <laughs> Never the Bride. Watch out for them, they're excellent. Never the Bride, yeah, really good. Two of them, and one, one of them plays everything on, on the set, like this huge set of keyboards. Right? Excellent. The other one sings like Janis Joplin. Great. Mm. Watch out for them. They should, they, they should be huge. They should be signed. We should take them on but tour. As we know, there is no justice. We might take them on tour, I hope so. It would be good. Good crack. So pardon the pun. Scottish girls. Scottish, you know. The one she makes her stage announcements, did you know she doesn't have that accent? <laughs> no, she? Well, all British bands have always done American stage announcements. Zodiac Mind Warp is the logical extreme, isn't it? <laughs> Illogical extreme is the Go ahead, head. headbanger, and make my day. Yeah, no. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> Zodi. So now the screwing can begin. All right, well, that's it. That's all we need from that. Was that all it was? Yeah. There is a lot of sexism in rock and roll, actually. And that's why there aren't more girl bands. Because there was certainly a resentment among a lot of the tight trouser brigade, you know. I don't know why, but they do see it as a threat. But I don't have that attitude, so I really, I really don't know what it is. Do you know what it is? No, I don't. I don't understand it because they never, they never bothered me. You know? But there is certainly a sort of prejudice against women playing rock and roll sound. People don't take them seriously, or they say like stupid things like they're good for they're girls. They're pretty good for girls. Mm -hmm. you know? I mean, Kelly Johnson in her in her best times would play the asshole off most of the guitarists you'd see in London. You know, I mean, she would slaughter them, hands down. You know, she was excellent. And she was so successful that she moved to America. You know what she's doing now? Loading boxes onto the back of a truck and downing on the night shift because she can't get a gig. She won the best guitarist I ever heard, a natural. Drag, innit? Oh, so much for the yeah. age of bloody Aquarius, eh? I'm all depressed now. Of course, she was a Gemini, actually. <laughs> Well, that would explain that then. Yeah, it? well, I didn't like the days of Aquarius because it was after me. I thought I was being robbed. <laughs> but it should have stayed Capricorn.